Welcome, everybody, to the inaugural episode of Maritime Health and Performance Chat. The goal is to bring in individuals who have experience in the realm of health and performance, highlighting the goings-on in the maritime provinces. Our wide variety of guests from all sorts of backgrounds ensure there will be something for everybody in this series. For the first episode, we want to start it off big, and we've got a, a guest to match uh, that sentiment. So we have head SNU strength and conditioning coach, Eric Richard, also good friend of mine and lab colleague. I won't bore you with his background because he can definitely explain it better than me. So Eric, the conch is yours. Hey, cool. Thanks for having me on. Super cool to, to jump in on something at the ground level and I'm excited to see what, uh, what you end up being able to do with this. But yeah, I, a little bit about me. <laughs> Every time I meet a new team or new athletes, they're, they're usually uh, stunned because I'm always larger than they are. Background, when I was younger, um, tons of sports. Everybody in this field always seems to have a ton of sports in their background. And as my body evolved, <laughs> as I aged, the sports naturally shifted to fit. Uh, when I was younger, I played soccer. I swam, played basketball. Um, and then when I, pretty much when I hit puberty, all of a sudden I started growing in every direction in size and uh, naturally football is the next thing. Sort of picked that up. I really loved it. Got into rugby in the off season because hitting people was super exciting and very fun, especially when you were, were bigger than everyone else. And then I was very fortunate to have a really good coach when I was in high school in New Brunswick that introduced me to wrestling also. So not only was I able to have some experience in contact sports, but then also be able to get kind of technical with it, which was super fun. It's kind of a really interesting side note because wrestling and judo were my two sports growing up. And, and it's funny because you were wrestling for New Brunswick and I have a lot of friends through there, uh, even in high school, just through provincial teams. But you and I never actually got to cross paths until well into uh, 2017 when we both started our Masters at Dow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The um, it, it, it's probably because I was in the uh, one fifteen or unlimited category, yeah, <laughs> of which there were fewer competitions. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say I was thinking I was about an eighty five kilo at the time. So, but yeah, yeah. about your uh, your background. Yeah, um, I was doing that, and I didn't really have an idea of what I wanted to do for school or anything in my grade twelve year. I was just playing sports and no real idea about what comes next. And then the football coaches, Jeff Cummins um, and Pete Frazier came down from Acadia University to do some recruiting. They, they knew my, my old head coach at, uh, at Bernice McNaughton, Ed Wasson, and uh, they met me and they were like, hey, do you, do you have any plans to play football? Are you looking to go anywhere? And I was like, well, I had no, <laughs> I had no idea. I was completely yeah. oblivious. I was completely oblivious to the, the university sport world. I didn't know what program was what, who was where. So they brought me down to uh, visit them watching a game at Mount A. And Acadia decimated Mount A by like, I don't know, it was like 40, 50 points easily. And I was like, hey, that's pretty cool first impression of a team that's trying to recruit me. And then I, I kind of went around. I was talking to some other places um, just because, you know, if someone's interested, maybe – Maybe someone else is too. Um, they ended up offering me a little bit of cash to come play. And when I went to Wolfville, I was kind of like, yeah, this is definitely the place for me. I, uh, I loved it right away. It's a cool small town, great vibe, great culture. And um, big spot I'm down in Mines Basin. I love driving down there. <laughs> yeah. I, the, the only thing I don't love that I'm glad I don't have to deal with anymore is the the absolutely ridiculous winter cycles that they go through. I think in my my third or fourth year, there was like a snowstorm every four days on a clock for like two months. But yeah, I went to Acadia. I started out, again, completely not even really sport related. I was in like psych or something my first year. And then I ended up transferring out because I was not liking it into kin because a lot of my teammates and, and sort of friends at the time were in kinesiology. And that's kind of what it kicked off for me. I was still playing, uh, getting into kin. It was all very interesting. And then my second year, about halfway through the season, I had a what they call traumatic neck injury that took me out of football. But I was in limbo for the following six months almost. I, I didn't know what was going on. All I knew is I had severe neck, shoulder, and uh, arm on my right arm, more severe, but a little bit on my left arm too. And then I got the news. I think it was like February the following year. I saw a neurospecialist and she's like, yep, yeah, no more contact sports for you. If you have one more traumatic incident, you could lose heart function, your lungs could stop working, etc. because the damage was pretty close to the, the base of the medulla, which regulates a lot of your autonomous function. But I was left with shredded nerves in the, in the shoulder. So uh, they told me all this terrible news. 
and then gave me no answers. They gave me no recourse, no, hey, this is what's happened to you. Here's how you fix it. So at 19, with a giant football body, I had no idea what I was supposed to do with it or how I could recover. The first thing that was absolutely terrible is I didn't sleep properly for years. Like probably until we met in 2017, that was the first year I had like normal sleep without pain. Imagine that, 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 that recipe alone into my, my mental state, trying to get through all that was, was different, but I definitely came out better in the end. Um, so that really kind of pushed me deeper into kin. I was already in it, sports science and sort of looking into, okay, how do injuries happen? How do you make them better? How do you get stronger? How do you recover nerves? There's just a million and one questions that I started to ask and I, I just really threw myself into academics because now sport was no longer an option. I got the, I got the football bug and I was big enough and everyone was like, yeah, you could go all the way. And I was like, Hey, cool. And then you have that taken away and you got to find something else to do. Um, and I dreaded it because I, you know, everyone that's played sports, you see people that kind of like have a career ending injury or a reason to be done. And then they're just never fully the same if they don't move on from it. Well, there's almost like kind of, a, and this isn't the best uh, way to compare it to, but some people call it like a, like a retirement from sport, almost like a PTSD. Like they, they have this, this, uh, this shock to the system and this mentality and this, uh, they're stuck in that sport mentality through their training, their diet, their just mm -hmm. lifestyle. Um, mm -hmm. and that's, and a lot of people kind of identify that that is their life. And then once it's gone, they're just so lost. Yeah, absolutely. I think the, the biggest thing everyone goes through, especially when you hold it really close to your, who you are, um, you go through a bit of an identity crisis. Oh, of course. Um, and then, you know, you get like separation anxiety, whether it's from the sport, your teammates, your training environment, whatever. I know that I went through a tremendous amount of anxiety because a ton of my teammates had no idea what exactly had happened to me. And no one really communicated it. And in retrospect, I did not do a good job telling my teammates what happened. Everyone was just like, oh, he's hurt and he's not playing anymore. But years later, reconnecting with guys as I explain it to them, they're all like, holy crap, had we known you know, we would have been more supportive or more this or that, which is yeah. nobody's fault. It's just, you go through a lot of stuff when you hold sport that close to, to who you are. Oh my um, God, yeah, just kind of as you mature too, kind of that communication becomes easier. But at 19 years old, it's not easy to be that vulnerable and say, hey, I'm really anxious. Like I really, I'm really feeling that separation from the team and, and the sport and mm -hmm. stuff. Like I miss it. Absolutely. And I think the, the biggest thing, and this may be personal, I don't know if other people have the same experience, but the biggest thing that bothered me was I didn't even have the choice to be done. It was chosen for me. That's it. Like at least, you know, if you could have ended on your own terms, right? You know, you could have said, well, I, I, I did everything I could here. Not that you, not that you didn't obviously, but you know, you could have had years and years to work and hone the craft and then it's kind of taken from you like that. Totally. So with that kind of that, that, situation, I guess, that mental state, whatever. I, I decided, I remember going home that Christmas, uh, even before I had found the news of what was going on. And I just thought, I'm going to do everything I can academically because I have clearly, I guess it was the Christmas after, but it was shortly after finding out that it yeah. was done permanently. I just completely threw myself headfirst into studies and academics. Um, I went through the program. There's a practicum program you apply for in your third year. It's like 10 or 11 kin students picked out of a class of 250 or something that, that go in through rigorous, more specific classes towards like exercise, programming, prescription. Uh, we did a lot of uh, chronic conditions. The, the goal was to get you to come out with some certifications and expand your practical knowledge and skill set. So, you know, I was volunteering for a million and one things at that point. So I was doing all the schoolwork. Uh, we were very fortunate. Elliot Richard, um, Elliot Richardson was the head strength and conditioning coach, even when I was an athlete, but all the way through afterwards. And he was super supportive, uh, huge mentor of mine and, and great guidance. Took me on as an intern. So I was interning with uh, sports teams, uh, women's rugby and women's basketball primarily in my last two years. And then um, an active aging program, working with people that were, were getting older and needed to be physically active to sort of stop some negative uh, side effects of getting old. Training some people with diabetes, neuromuscular disorders, cardiac problems, like you name it. I just kind of tried everything you could. Uh, the only thing I regret is that I didn't try any of the volunteer opportunities with like kids and kids with uh, any kind of disabilities, which, which I think would have been extremely rewarding. But I mean, you know. <laughs> You do yeah, a million one things you get. 
<laughs> yeah, you can't do everything. <laughs> I think it's really important to note that, you know, you said that about 11 students out of 200 got picked for this, this internship program. And that's the same thing through a lot of universities, colleges, and a lot of um, within the, the faculties too, right? There's going to be special programs, special opportunities, whether they're internships or co-ops or whatever, to, to really network and advance yourself within the field if you really have a, a drive and really that's what you really want to do. Um, so I think it's a really good note that like, you know, for students, like if, if you think that you're in something you want to do, bust your ass, right? Your profs notice that. Show up to class every day, you know, be on time with your assignments, work hard, you know, and, and the grades will come, but those opportunities will come as well when your, your profs and, and your teachers and stuff start seeing that, that hard work you put in. And, and it's really led to a lot of great opportunities for you, which I'll let you continue uh, building on now. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, the, uh, the personal philosophy has always been you're working for the job you want, not the one you have. Exactly. That's where you got um, a little extra volunteer hours, a little extra work, yeah. and then eventually the money comes and, the, and, and it builds on that. Exactly. I, I've never been one that wants to be complacent with what I'm doing. Um, it gets too boring and boredom becomes depressing for a lot of people. So I just, yeah. I can't, I don't like stagnating. Um, so yeah, I mean, all those different things, but the big one, the big flagship one for me was was the strength and conditioning program. My first, uh, I guess it was my summer before my fourth year, I was, I had applied for the summer internship, which was a, like a stipend kind of paid internship position, which was really cool. And there were only like five or six of us that got picked for that. And that was super cool because it, you know, big chance to develop some autonomy, experience different things, just practice things you otherwise wouldn't do in the normal year in the internship. And then it kind of separated us from the main core of interns when we got back in the fall because we had so much practical experience essentially starting to work. And then that following year, everything was just working towards finishing school, graduating, getting certified. But I think by the end of my fourth year, I had a, a year and a half of resume experience that was like valid and, and good for applying for jobs. And then when I graduated, I got, um, I got my CSCS through the NSCA and my uh, CSEP CEP. So I'm an exercise physiologist and a strength and conditioning specialist. And uh, all of those efforts that I put in for the previous two and a half years led up to that, that ultimate point of accomplishing all those things kind of simultaneously. I, will, I won't lie and say it wasn't stressful. It was extremely <laughs> stressful. It was always busy. But every year since school has been equal or more busy, but less takes less mental effort because you get better at it. Yeah. And then uh, I guess kind of transitioning into my actual professional career, which was super cool. Uh, I was just working as an intern doing my thing in my fourth year. And there was a guy, uh, Jeremy Steinbeck, who was coming down from the Canadian Sports Center Atlantic in Halifax. And he would come down to, to help and kind of volunteer and do some extra work or whatever in the evenings. And we would overlap sometimes. And he basically was like, back to his boss, he was like, hey, this is a really cool kid coming out of Katie. I guess you should hire him because he was taken off for a year to go work with uh, the national women's hockey team. It was a great opportunity. So I basically got an offer halfway through fourth year. <laughs> I think it's huge to note that all these opportunities that you got, you know, you busted your ass for them, right? Like you, like you said, it was stressful. It was a lot of work, but you know, it started coming together and that's kind of, sometimes people want to wear the, wear the Jersey, but they, they don't want to, put in the work, right? And, and you're an excellent example of, uh, you know, constantly learning what's, you know, new new evidence and new new research that's coming out, always trying to improve your craft. So that's something I really appreciate about someone like you in the strength conditioning field. Yeah, I appreciate that. The, uh, it just, it just kind of go, I like the old adage, if you, I think I said this the other day in the meeting or yesterday, <laughs> if you fail to prepare, you prepare to fail. But then my, the other side of that coin, I think, not saying it's opposite, but just they're kind of two in the same is success is when preparation meets opportunity. Yeah. And I love that formula because you can influence your preparation infinitely as much as you have the capacity to influence your own uh, creativity or drive is your limitation to your preparation. And then opportunities kind of come, I've found, as you continue to focus on your preparation aspect, like if you show that your skills are more refined or better, or more advanced or whatever you want to say, more opportunities come. And opportunities in this career field, especially, I have noticed, regardless of who I talk to, snowball. So you start small 
and it grows over time as long as you're not an idiot and doing all the right things and actually, you know, getting certified and finding the right information and applying it properly. So in my mind, I'm looking at it now and I'm like, thank God I started working my butt off early because that means the snowball is going to get bigger sooner in my life, which is kind of where, where everything transitioned from there. So I graduated from Acadia. I went on a great graduation trip to, to cap off. It's almost like a mental cap, just something objective <laughs> to say that's done and over with. Yeah. And then I started working at the sports center and uh, that snowballed significantly. That first year out of school is my first true test of how I could manage and deal with stress. And that's when you and I had met because I had gotten in to do master's uh, in kinesiology with, you know, specializing biomechanics alongside with you in our program. And I was also working probably way too much at the sports center. <laughs> I, um, I would basically get up for a good six months between 20, summer 2017 and summer 2018. I would be up at like four in the morning. And I'd get home at like 9 p.m. And I would do that over and over again until I got shingles, <laughs> which, which does not naturally happen usually in people our age. No, exactly. You got to be pretty burnt out, run down immune system for, for anything like that to occur. Yeah, so that took me out for like two weeks in the spring or the early, I guess it would have been early winter 2018. But that was also a huge eye-opening moment because up to that point, I had been saying yes to every possible thing thrown my way. Um, so that was my my first life lesson of don't be the yes man. Um, however, <laughs> I seemed to manage it okay because those opportunities continue to snowball. I think I ended up doing programming and training for for close to 10 provincial teams by the end of my, might even be more than that, by the end of my tenure at the sports center. Well, um, I was going to say, every, every week you came in, it seemed like you were saying, ah, they got me with uh, this team now. Oh, they added me with this team now. Like you were, yeah. you were really snowballing, like that's a pretty good example of it. Yeah, it was, I, I kind of look back at that first year and think, okay, that was a year where I really tested my, my um, organizational and emotional limits around what I do. There were some failures, but you know, job wise, there were successes or smaller successes, but it, I didn't, I can't really remember if there were any like severe failures at my workplace, but a ton of lessons learned that helped me set up for everything that was going to come after. So continuing on kind of the snowball and preparation plus opportunity equals success. The uh, summer 2018, towards the end of the summer, my boss and the president at the sports center, Ken Bagnall, uh, put me in touch with the head men's hockey coach at SMU and he said hey this guy uh, our kids play hockey together he's looking for some training for some private kids so originally I was coming into SMU a couple of years ago just to train a few private kids to end off the summer because the guy that was there doing training for them was moving on so I was like okay cool extra cash and then I got there and within a week it was hey do you want to train the varsity men's hockey team and I couldn't say no that's a no that, that's when it's okay to be the yes man yeah, absolutely. I like <laughs> literally a month earlier, I had a job review or I had a performance review at the sports center and they said, what do you want to do? And I said, university head strength coach. And a month later, an opportunity pops up. There's no way I'm saying no to that. And thank God you were prepared because that's where success <laughs> comes from. Absolutely. Um, and then I think from there, within like four weeks, all of a sudden I had four or five varsity teams. Um, and then by the turn of the year going into 2019, I had everybody except a few. And now I'm now in the head strength coach at SMU. <laughs> yeah. and, and an interesting side note, uh, Eric has given me a wonderful opportunity to be a uh, strength conditioning intern working under him and, and as well as several other of his kind of senior and junior interns who have been with him for uh, several uh, semesters now. And also to be noted, if you go check out the uh, – SMU Strength Conditioning Instagram page, you can see a link to apply to an intern. I know Eric's always looking for more bodies and really dedicated people who have a passion for strength conditioning and health to kind of come and, and get experience. And it's a it's a win-win kind of relationship. Yeah, definitely. I um, COVID's made it a little bit strange, but we definitely, I, I want to foster um, an environment where I can share these lessons, especially while they're still professionally earlier on in my life to help get people on track to to succeed earlier and earlier and increase the professional standard, especially where there's a little bit of a void right now in, in Halifax in terms of what you can do for strength and conditioning education. Yeah, we don't even have a kin program at SMU, uh, so it's 100% just me. <laughs> <laughs> figuring it out from there they have to outsource for everything right interns yeah. and volunteers and all that yeah 
but uh complete side note really cool we might we might sometime down the road be able to turn this into like a diploma or certificate program underneath uh like a regular degree major where you could be like a major in bio with a with a sort of certificate in high performance or something. Well, like you kind of said, you want to you want to create that path to just to just you know improve the the kind of strength conditioning world within you know Nova Scotia and the Maritimes and stuff. Absolutely, and I I find like I I will never I will never lie and say that you don't need a background in kinesiology. Um, I think that you need to have knowledge in that field, but I I have found some of the best interns that I have who aren't even in kinesiology programs. Yeah. Because to succeed in this field, you do need a good knowledge foundation. But you also have to be, as Elliot used to say, certifiably nice, which is a hundred percent true. You, you can't really buy personalities, but you can buy your education. Yeah. So, you know, I, I'm usually looking for the people who have great personalities and seem like they have a good aptitude for being a good people person rather than how much they know but yeah i guess that's that's kind of the nutshell of of me going from having no idea what i want to do with my adult life to um <laughs> snowballing into a head strength coach at a university <laughs> pretty pretty amazing path that i don't think i was gonna say not many people could say but i don't really think anybody else could say that's a pretty <laughs> bold claim i don't know everyone in the world so can't quite make it but i'm still pretty confident in it yeah, I think there are there are definitely some other people. I, I've seen some people on social media in the states that are probably at the same same time frame as me, out of probably yeah. necessity more than anything. But it is really cool to be able to start off young while I still have a ton of energy because this this kind of workload that I'm under, for example, is not sustainable forever. No. Um, so as we continue to try and build a professional standard, we're trying to create more opportunities for strength and conditioning professionals to one have jobs, but two to evolve and develop. Yep. with the hopes that they can then go on out of the Maritimes to succeed and create this sort of flow from where we're educating people coming in their first year to leaving to go, you know, raise the standard wherever they go, regardless of where they come from. Yeah, of course. Um, I really like just in our, in our meeting yesterday where you kind of said, and this, this is a great takeaway for not just strength conditioning professionals, but anyone who runs any sort of program, uh, a coach or, or anything else. Uh, you said that through this, you know, through the teaching and education, you know, you want to make it so no one person is greater than the whole the program, right? Like if someone's gone, it keeps rolling forward. It keeps progressing. Right. Uh, and I think yeah. that's such an amazing mentality, right? That where you're, you're not here with the ego saying, I have to be the one, the one to develop these, these athletes, right? You actually mm -hmm. are promoting kind of delegating different responsibilities to build leaders, build better strength coaches, build better people, and also just build a, a good program that's going to last for years and years to come. And, and I love that mentality. I appreciate it. Yeah, I, I appreciate that sentiment coming from you. And, and just in general, like, I think above all else, a lot of people get caught up in numbers. Yeah. And sport is, as much as people don't like to admit, it can be an objectively cold place. You win <laughs> or you don't. And if you yeah. don't win, you might get fired. We're trying to, with our program, create a culture around strength and conditioning and high performance and a community. And like you said, so that if one person has to leave or move on or whatever happens, the, the entity itself will continue to function and, and improve. So this is really, we're building like this smooth strength and conditioning system, which I say building, although we've I've pretty much built it, um, <laughs> but I don't believe that any kind of an organic system when you deal in people is ever truly finished because Definitely. people are going to change. Every generation of kids coming out now are already significantly different. And you and I are not that old at, and like kids coming in at 18, they are light years different than we were at 18. Oh my God. Yeah. Already. So like we need to have a systematic approach that has flexibility to adapt to the times. And that's kind of part of where you are and, you know, being in a lab setting with you uh, as colleagues, uh, you know, always seeing you and you've always been happy to share and discuss as well, but you're always up to date on like the new evidence, current research and stuff, right? And that's kind of part of adapting with the times. And it's really important to kind of immerse yourself in that research culture because sometimes it's a little dry to read those academic papers, mm -hmm. but um, you can't just read one, take the results and say, this is going to work for everyone, right? No, maybe they're totally. Working untrained males 20 to 30 right you need, yeah. to, you need to immerse yourself in, in the evidence coming out and also the roots right where it all came from uh mm -hmm. for so many different populations and, and, and training methodologies because everyone's different 
technique, yeah. nutrition, um, people's anatomy, physiology, it's all so different from person to person. So, I mean, as a strength conditioning coach, flexibility in your plans and your programming is just so important. Yeah, 100%. The, uh, even in our meetings, we're going to have the rest of this week, like we're going to see a million and one ways to modify a simple squat or any kind of body type. Cause we're, you know, especially in what I do, like I'll encounter a six foot eight basketball player and we need him to still get strong, put on mass, but then we could also have a five foot two rugby girl. Now, <laughs> like we need it to be specific to them. So you have to adapt to the times. And, and one thing that I roll with, especially with, with staff around me has always been all methods necessary. There's uh, I had someone, it might've been a year and a half ago, someone, uh, this moment just stuck out for me. They're like, what kind of programming do you believe in? And all I could think, I like took a moment and I was like, what a trap of a question. <laughs> Because there is no one program that is the ultimate program permanently. There are things that are better for certain situations, but at the end of the day, it's what's your intent with training? What's your end goal? Does the method that you're looking at or using help you achieve that end goal? So like we've, I've used probably every major thing you can find out there. And now what we have at SMU is this sort of best of everything approach where we've taken the best bits from lots of different major programming methodologies and created this systematic approach where this year we've also started to create a uh, an athlete feedback system where, you know, the program has a variety of cool components from a lot of different things. Like you see a little bit of powerlifting stuff in there in the programming, a lot of Olympic lifting stuff, but you'll also see some, some pretty unconventional programming. I've been told that I am aggressive with my programming, <laughs> which I, I, that's not a bad thing. You know, I, I just think that with what I've gone through, through physical strength, not, not everyone's the same. And you see people who are way stronger than I am, but people don't know their limits unless they are shown that it can be achieved. So I am trying to aggressively push people in the direction of, oh, you think you're done, but there's so much more. <laughs> yeah. Um, you're just getting started. Yeah, and now we're trying to create the onus and the ownership from the athlete to engage in the program more actively instead of, because for the first few years, setting up a lot of the system was very much like taking everything that I know, creating a system for them, and here's the program, you show up, you do training, whatever, and you individualize it based on circumstance. You know, if like someone can't do a back squat, you modify that. But that's like very light individualization, whereas this year we're starting to educate the athletes on actual theories and concepts that we're using and applying so that different levels of athletes, some athletes won't care but some of them will ask questions constantly. And I've been very fortunate to always have, even if not a complete answer, a partial answer and a direction to where to go find out more. Yeah, of course. I mean, and that's, that's the best you can do, right? You don't want to kind of pull something out of your, out of your ass and, and mislead someone, right? You, totally. You give them what you can and then give them the resources to continue learning. Absolutely. And I, I remember too, like you were probably the same, like you'd get programs and you would never truly do a hundred percent of the program or you would, you would do like 80 something percent of the program and then throw your own little mix into the, the equation. Yeah, no, I was notorious for adding extra workout days, which is shit that I wanted to try. So I didn't have that, um, that privilege because fortunately, unfortunately my strength conditioning coach, my father. <laughs> so, so where are you going? If, if I was going to another gym or something like that, he, he'd know. <laughs> so it was, pretty, it was pretty easy to have my uh, – it was really easy. I was really, really blessed um, in my high school days to, to have that because I had pretty well – you know, something you see professional athletes and Olympic athletes get, like almost like a personal strength conditioning and nutrition uh, specialist, right? So it was a pretty yeah. – a good time for me to, to stay on with that consistency. So, I mean, we've been going on for a while. I think you're probably going to have, as far as my guests uh, go, one of the most extensive uh, backgrounds of so much to cover. But uh, And you've covered so much of this already. But what is one thing that you feel you're doing to get ahead in your field, to stand out, kind of rise above the rest of them? I have to probably pick the mentorship piece. I think people naturally get very protective of their own information and skills. And I've seen it firsthand where people are reluctant to share what they do and how they do it. But I've also been very fortunate to encounter people who are ready and willing to teach you things that are definitely way out of your scope of practice or even experience level. But those plant seeds for later down the road as you continue to get better. I think of the best example was when I was at the Sports Center, Scott Wilgress, who's an amazing high-performance strength and conditioning professional, started showing me a 
lot of like data stuff that he would do. He would loop me in and ask me questions, what I think about this. And it got my brain turning way ahead of when I even started doing some of this stuff and showed me the next level of things that he was doing with Olympic level athletes, which is super cool. And now we're at a point where like those seeds he planted a couple of years ago have now grown into influence some of the things we do on a larger scale with varsity level university athletes. But that wouldn't have happened without good mentorship. So I'm trying to establish that earlier and get a little more hands-on. And as much as I, I love my mentor, Elliot, when I was at Acadia, you know, there were things that could have been more accessible for us. Because at the end of the day, every professional, and you only realize that once you start working in the field, that like it's busier than it seems when you're looking from the outside. In. When you finally are in it, it's 10 times busier. And there were, I'm trying to take the lessons learned from things I would have liked to have learned when I was an intern and give them to our interns now. That's an amazing mentality because it's, it really is so important in, in anything, right? Whether you, you like music, sports, whatever, give back, right? Absolutely. Uh, for, for me, through uh, wrestling and judo and stuff, like I got so many opportunities and made some amazing friends and, and you know, great things to kind of pump up my CV and stuff. So, so you know, I've been a coach. Like, actually, you, you got me back into coaching um, within Halifax because uh, you asked me to come out with you that one time to the Canada Games Center, and that kind of sparked me being a coach there for, for quite a while. Um, so, I mean, giving back is so important. I love that mentality uh, that you bring to the table. Thanks. Appreciate that. I, uh, I, I'd like to think I was speaking to someone the other day, but I, I was thinking like there are some people who spend 10 years getting to a point where they're like a, a lead or a head at whatever they do. And then they spend their thirties kind of going through consolidation. And then by the time they're in their forties, they're like pretty much set. I would like to shave 10 years off that process. <laughs> <laughs> Right on. Well, um, I guess you, you, you mentioned a little, little earlier where COVID's kind of made things a little tricky with the with the internships and, and training athletes. So uh, maybe go into a bit of like how the current kind of pandemic has really affected your work and what sort of considerations and modifications have you had to make to continue servicing your athletes and, and your interns? This, this one gets pretty cold and objective. COVID, regardless of how people feel about it, is happening. We had, uh, we encountered some pretty direct uh, uh, experiences from this. I, I didn't get it, but I've seen how it affects people so far. The biggest thing to keep in mind with everything around COVID is purpose of your job and what we what we do. So one thing that I reiterate a lot to staff and peers at, at SMU is we have a duty of responsibility and a duty of care to keep the athletes safe. So a lot of our policies are collectively built around that. You know what I mean? If we're doing something, is it going to put someone at risk? And now with the factor of, is it going to put them at risk of COVID, then we don't do it. There's no reason to do it. So we've had to, the one negative in terms of it being uncomfortable because it's busier, but positive in the sense that we have a lot more control as our day has been spread out to give time in between because we have to have cleaning procedures that are a lot more rigorous than they, they ever have been. Uh, we do screening and tracking, which takes a little bit of time at the, each, at the beginning of each session. You know, and as a strength coach, like time is, is a, a limited resource that is extremely valuable that you don't get back once it's expended. So in most sessions, every second counts. So we've we've definitely had some some squish from covid procedures but they have to be done because for example when we did get hit with some covid stuff we were able to make adjustments and keep everything isolated we didn't have like this crazy outbreak or anything like it hit a few people and it it stayed at those few people because of our our restrictions and uh and change ups to the way we run things. So, you know, no athletes overlapping in training times which can make it a bit of a pain in the butt when um we still have a fair few athletes who have classes that cannot get out of a class or can't line up the lifting schedules with them where we now just can't service them, which sucks. That's probably the biggest downside to everything that's happened. But again, it's the duty of care to the most people um, yeah. where I would rather one athlete who can go get access in our public gym on their own time when their schedule works with the program, they have it anyways, than put another team at risk just to make sure that they get a workout. That's awesome. I mean, uh, one one point that you made, and, and before I get to that, like, uh, got to applaud you on just taking those measures because, you know, those are, that's what you have to do right now to make sure, like you said, ensure the uh, safety of the athletes. And I think that's a, 
that's a kind of an area that gets lost on some people, uh, especially when you see, you know, some trainers and stuff, but um, you're not just there to make people strong. You want to make them strong as possible. You want to give them the best performance as possible, but it's safety as well. You can't make someone strong if they drop a plate on their foot and they can't lift for two weeks, right? So it's, it's, it's got to be it, safety as much as hard training is, is, is so important. Absolutely. Well, there's so there's a lot of new stuff around COVID too. Like our therapy staff has a return to activity procedure that they have to follow, and they have to go through certain phases with anyone that had COVID, which is totally different ball game for for the therapy staff and athletes who are probably not used to going through a process like that. But yeah, like athletes getting sick, especially with like wait times around COVID tests and whatever. You know, if you're sick, a day isn't going to kill you. But we've had some athletes that got sick who didn't have COVID, but because of the procedures and policies. Uh, around getting tested and whatever, they would be out for a week and a half, two weeks. Yeah. And if you look at any any literature, two weeks is when you start losing those neural adaptations. You start seeing some involution yeah. in, your, in, in any sort of power gains, hypertrophic gains, or, or just yeah. strength gains. It's, it's, it's a dead stop. And then, you know, athletes are also stuck inside. And regardless of the support we give them, not every single one of them does at-home training. And they're also, they're sick. But even then, like, you just see everyone that we've had to experience come out of a quarantine is significantly deconditioned in a short period of time. And I would argue that a big portion of it is stress and anxiety. You know, they come out and they're just like, more than anything, they're like, oh my God, am I going to be able to catch up now? And all the athletes did. They did end up catching up and it was fine. But it's like that stress alone, your nervous system doesn't know whether you got stress from lifting a heavy weight or if you got stress because someone told you you're ugly. You know what I mean? It's stress is stress. Like... <laughs> God, I'd be a mess if uh, I got too stressed every time I heard that. <laughs> um, actually, it's a, it's a really good point because, you know, um, anxiety and increased stress levels are, whether it be from, from mental stress or physical stress, are directly related to cortisol or, or cortisol co uh, concentration, I should say, um, yep. which, which is, you know, responsible for, you know, some protein catabolism, breaking down that tissue, moving away to get the body ready for muscle remodeling. But if it's around too much and that protein breakdown starts happening a lot more than it should, that's when you start seeing, you know, that decreased strength and power. And, and for a high performance athlete and things like, say, football, a short season, that two weeks can really uh, affect them. So it's pretty amazing that you were able to get your athletes caught up and, and ready to go when they came back from those uh, positive COVID tests, positive tests, but uh, self-isolating. No, it's definitely the, uh, I find it's kind of funny because I keep coming back to the education piece. A lot of my time spent interacting with athletes now is actually just teaching them how to take care of themselves better. Sleep hygiene, sleep habits, uh, organizational skills, like how essentially things that remove as much stress or mitigate stress as much as possible by preparation, which then the roadblock that we deal with more often than not is the level of maturity of the athlete. Being a high performance athlete isn't something that you naturally become. It's a mindset. You have to embrace, I am a high performance athlete in a high performance program, but I have to act like it. I actually have to earn it. You aren't just automatically a high performance athlete because you got into university. And that's, that's kind of a, a thing that I find people are not good at communicating or maybe not aware of is it kind of, most people would probably relate to this. It's like when anyone was on any team that won a championship and the guy, the, the guy or the girl that rode the bench also acts like a champion. It's like, I don't know if we earned it the same there. You know what I mean? Like there's arguments I've heard people say about, oh, well, they helped you out in the practice squad, but there's always like a few where it's like, I don't know if you contributed to any of this, but yet you're, <laughs> you're claiming something. So you have to actually do it. It's a hard truth, but it's still the truth. Absolutely. And I love hard truths because I swear I missed my, my assistant last year. He used to have uh, bad personalities on some teams, always address like, oh man, blah, blah, blah. I'm upset about this. Man, I should just transfer. And, and my assistant would always respond with, then do it. <laughs> and it was brilliant because you call them out then and there. So they're either not going to transfer and they're going to pick up their pants and do what they're supposed to do, or they really don't belong there and they're not contributing to a high performance environment mentality. Therefore losing them is a benefit for everybody. Yeah. I heard a really good, uh, really good kind of analogy of this for, you know, and this, and this can go for anything, you know, any strength conditioning program, a coaching staff for a team, uh, a, a work staff, right? Uh, mm -hmm. about the bus you know everyone that you have in your staff has a seat on that bus mm -hmm. and, and sometimes people's seats change right sometimes you shuffle around some people sometimes 
you've gotten to someone's destination, it's time for them to get off the bus and bring someone new on, right? Yeah. But um, everyone, and it's really important that, you know, everyone establishes their role to have that best, you know, that best cooperation, that best collaboration to really benefit the athletes the most. I, I, I like that analogy a lot because immediately it made me think the flip side to the athletes is, you know, making sure that, that coaches, whether they're strength coaches or sport coaches, which you could call the drivers in, in that analogy, uh, are driving in the right direction. Oh, exactly. The accountability that they're leading us in the right direction, because I've seen it before and everybody's probably seen it, but not totally addressed it where a coach might be driving the bus in the wrong direction, but then the focus is on the athlete who senses it and makes noise about it, but everyone ignores them because they're not aware of the accountability of the driver. So sometimes I've seen shift get blamed to the wrong direction, which is kind of outside of my my direct influence when it comes to to that. But I mean, in recent, recent years, I haven't really seen that too much, which is really good because everyone has to have a common vision moving forward. And, and that's where, especially in our end, like I try and make sure that all the interns are 110% bought in and aware of what we're doing and why we're doing it. Because yeah. if they don't, they're not going to confidently help us out with their athletes. And if the athletes notice that they're not confident, then the athlete's not going to be confident in what we're doing either. Yeah. Well, uh, we're, we're surprisingly coming up near about 50 minutes. Um, so I guess we'll probably wrap, wrap up now. Um, just before we finish up, is there anything you want to highlight? Any projects or programs, uh, or social media, anything like that? I know we talked about it a bit, but time to, time to reiterate and really hammer, that, hammer those home. Yeah, I mean, um, we're we're just trying to survive another COVID semester more than anything. But always, always looking for new interns, regardless of background, uh, degree, whatever. We usually have application periods. I think we're wrapping up our. I took my final one for this semester, but every semester we kind of open it up for new interns. And the link, like you said, is on our Instagram page, which is at SMU underscore strength. We have a new social media plan coming out. We kind of have content and then go dark a bit just because things get busy. We don't have like a truly dedicated social media set up yet, but we have an intern that's going to try and spearhead it this semester. Um, so there's there's cool kind of content on there just to show us what we're doing. Um, right on. Well, all right, you yeah. right there, folks. Make sure you go check out SMU SNC on Instagram. And obviously in the uh, when this video rolls out, we'll throw a... We'll tag them in the description so they'll be nice and easy to find for you. And if you have any sort of inkling that you know, strength conditioning uh, might be the, the place for you, whether it be with general population, clinical populations, uh, or, or ath athletics in any kind of area, whether it be high performance, recreation level, whatever, you got to start getting your experience somewhere. So, so if you want a really worthwhile uh, experience and really get bang for your buck, and I say buck, but it's free to volunteer, this is where you should be going. This is this is an internship program to look you know to look at and, and keep watching and, and keep an eye on this page for uh, more things to come in the future. And I know I'm really excited to start my internship. Can't Sweet. wait. Thanks, thanks so much for having me on. I I appreciate it, and I'm excited to see what you end up doing with uh, with this series. It's gonna I be know. Really cool. I mean, you're you're about I think the fifth we've recorded so far. Just trying to get as many recorded right now while I have a bit more free time and. Um, it's funny. It's 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 not the the script that I that I've kind of put to guide these kind of interviews, but it's more so the tangents we're going on that that's mm -hmm. really providing some nice little nuggets of wisdom coming out. So I'm really really enjoying these, and I can't wait to uh to yeah see where they're going and put this one out. Sweet. Thanks, Matt. No worries. Thanks for joining us.